So welcome to The Lost Word. Thank you for joining us. Again this evening we have Father Tony Sylvia and David Newman. Mm -hmm. And tonight's topic is the Horned God. And I'd like to start out by just talking a little bit about the Horned God in ancient times. Um, most of the evidence we have for the Horned God is found in what is known as Gaul, France, Germany, that general area of Western mm -hmm. Europe. But uh, these are what are considered Celtic peoples, um, and the Horned God is known as uh, Kernunos, Kernunos, which is from one uh, inscription uh, next to one of these figures out of you know, which I think there are dozens, um, at least, if not more. Um, but it was, interestingly enough, the imagery can be traced back even further to prehistoric times in uh, Denmark. They found uh, drawings on rock or etchings on rock or on uh, metal of the horned god, usually a phallic god with horns, uh, holding a weapon, sword, or axe, or also near or holding a ship, interestingly enough. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. You know, these were that one. considered yeah. like Viking peoples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so probably a lot of their stuff was positioned relatively near ships. <laughs> ships. Yeah, ships and fighting were huge. Yeah. Um, so that's the earliest they can trace it back in Europe, um, but the, what they call the cult of the horn god is like widely attested, you know, by these images on, it's like religious imagery. Mm -hmm. um, now would this be a part of a, of a um, pantheistic system where there was a number of, where one community say would have a number of gods, or was this more like a, this community was a horn god community and another community was something else. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, from what I can gather, and based on the evidence, which again is very scant because all you've got is uh, Caesar's, uh, you know, Gallic Wars, mm -hmm. um, and these uh, Celtic myths written down by Irish monks, most likely. I mean, uh, Irish and Welsh monks. Christian monks. Mm -hmm. So there's not a whole lot of actual material to work from primary sources. So it seems like each locality, whether that's a tribe or some other grouping, had their, their own like god of the tribe, mm -hmm. which was known as Tutates by the Romans anyway. That's what they called it. Or it and uh, then there were also other gods, it seems like, and there are whole pantheons of gods. And it wasn't necessarily the same as like the Greek and Roman, the way we think of it. Um, you know, they, they were much more like multifaceted and sometimes it might be easy to assume that they were somehow humans that had been like, you know, elevated in status, you know, for some reason to God status in these myths. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to know exactly uh, what they believed and what they believed about their gods and their religion. Um, they were involved in uh, human sacrifice, so that does seem to be a valid uh, claim. I know that's been disputed by some people, but... Um, it does seem like a big part of yeah, their, their tradition. Found those bodies in the bogs. I mean, that were sacrificed. Yeah, they were, and <clears throat> different gods. You know, some they would, you know, put up in a tree and wound. Oh yeah, that was like to Isis, uh, Tyrannus. They would, I think, boil them in the cauldron, or that was Tutates maybe. But uh, and the other one they would burn in the. But those were, those were mostly prisoners, right? They were usually people convicted of crimes, and then they would use them. You will then. This case, purpose. It's hard. To, it's hard to know for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. Again, there's really not much to go on, so we don't know. Like uh, these people who were, who died, may have been sacrificial victims. You know, they may not have been uh, quite the way we would think of it as uh, you know somebody going, like 
against their will to mm. their to meet their doom. Throw Plus, the virgins into the volcano. Yeah, and their yeah. idea of the afterlife was such that you know they apparently were far less uh, fearful of death in general because they didn't believe that you know there was an end once the body mm -hmm. stopped living. So, um, yeah, so just to reiterate this, uh, at least from the academic sense, they know this horn god was like a phallic god. Um, the horns and the symbolism, obviously, they connect with virility and fecundity and nature, um, the zoomorphic imagery, you know, man and animal combined, um, you know, the stag being like a very virile, you know, animal. That's the way I've always thought about the one god. It just that just always been my perception of what the one god was. Right. It was as a symbol of the male sexual energy. Now the the horns, um, the two horns. Um, I think it was Julian Vane who first kind of like clued me in that you know maybe this was related not just to the idea of you know like connected with the stag or this idea of virility or this very strong important animal um, that sometimes seems kind of otherworldly and um, is it the goal of the hunt but also that uh, horns are like a symbol of duality. This horn god is often if not always depicted with uh, serpents, serpent or more than one serpent and most of the time these serpents are horned as well or have what appear to be like ram's heads. Mm. Um, which is interesting. Um, Where's that from? I haven't seen that. Yeah, this is in the in the Kernanos image from the Gundestrop cauldron, which we'll add in. Mm -hmm. um, and many others, uh, they're either holding the serpent oh, I know or... That, yeah. And in fact, in, in one of the uh, Irish myths uh, about, I think it's like one of the cattle raids um, the, from the Ulster tales, there's a hero named Connell Kernach, I think is how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And in at, he's sort of charged with taking and destroying a fort, and uh, there's a serpent that supposedly guards it and guards the treasures in this fort. Now, Kernach, Connell Kernach is connected with the Horn God because of his name, mm -hmm. last name, the Kern, Kernach root. And um, interestingly, at the end of the story, the serpent leaps into his body at the belt, at the girdle, and uh, together, Connell and the serpent, with the serpent being inside his body, destroy the fort and take the treasures. So that makes it, I mean, it makes a perfect analogy for rising the Kundalini. It does, but um, you know, academics and mythologists and people looking at this story, they say, you know, well, the serpent's there to guard the treasure. Why does it then help Connell to destroy it, the fort that it's protecting, and take the treasure? You know, they see the serpent as the as a guardian of treasure. The same idea of like the dragon and yeah. Beowulf, or the monster and Beowulf. Um, and even back to you know the early centuries of Christianity, the the serpent that guards the pearl in the, the Hymn of the Pearl, the Gnostic text. Yeah, so... I think it, you're right, though. That is, that is that serpent. It's dangerous, and it's a guardian, but it's also uh, that secret force inside man that... Yeah, it can go either way, right? It can. It can be. It's of great danger. We know that. Um, Wisdom can be used either way. Right. So, but the interesting thing is... Um, when we, you know, when we look at when we look at mythology in in that way, it's I think in it a more uh, informed esoterically, but it's it's like only one way of looking at it. If you think of like the variety of spectrum of interpretations of myth, mm -hmm. um, I think it's the one I prefer, but. Um, we also, I think my point is that we just don't know. So overall though, I mean, I always thought this serpent was a symbol for the goddess, wasn't it? Is it I mean, it's one of the main symbols for the goddess. Yeah, well, I think that's always been interpreted as a feminine in yeah. aspect. Um, 
oftentimes I think even in experientially when people have that experience, the voice or voices they may associate with it are feminine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the Holy Spirit or the Shekinah is, is a feminine aspect. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we could probably go off and do a whole other show on the serpent. It's just interesting how, yeah. that, how that's associated. Yeah, so this horned horn god and the serpent are right. totally connected. Um, and I think that's why I find this imagery of the horned god in ancient times so interesting because we can't say for certain anything about the meaning of the imagery, but the esoteric tradition gives us a way to interpret it that I think is actually more educated in many ways. I don't know what you think of that idea. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to. Uh said the ancient people didn't understand. Yeah, I'm not saying they didn't understand yeah, it. They, might have, they yeah. may have known exactly. Yeah, exactly. But the interesting thing is in the modern esoteric tradition claims that, that they did, in fact, know. Right, right, so and that, that we are connected with in the same... Yeah, the inheritors of Very the same yeah. inheritors. That's the mm -hmm. perfect I mean, way of expressing it. It's the academic it. people that, 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 are, that are pondering over all these different meanings, whereas maybe we are coming as a, from the point of view of esoteric or occultists, don't have to think too hard on it. We yeah, already have, you know what I mean? It seems more obvious. Right, because, it seems more obvious to us because that's our, yeah. that's our science, so to speak. And my argument would be very much in alignment with the way that we all kind of interpret Baphomet or the Horned God as, you know, a unification of opposites, the idea of man and nature being the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, the idea of virility and uh, strength and you know fecundity in nature. I think all of those ideas are connected. Um, and the Kundalini and the serpent power, I think, is exactly you know part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Right. Well, especially if he's always, if if the corn god is always depicted with a serpent, or is often depicted mm -hmm. with a serpent, that is also a symbol of that unison of the male and female. Yeah, and I think in the Baphomet image, you find that in the phallic caduceus, and that's where you find the serpent imagery there. It wasn't until Christianity that uh, the horn god became so much of a problem, right. really. And I, I want to just read the quote. Um, it's pretty brief. From This is from Pagan Celtic Britain, which is by Anne Ross, which is pretty much like the authoritative text on this. Um, she said, The horned god was transformed into a prototype for the horned squatting devil, and written traditions concerning this cult figure would be severely censored by the church. Um, so it would was like a severe problem and they suppressed it hmm. completely and the next thing you know you have during the witch persecutions these all of the Christian texts about dealing with the witch trials you know the witches sabbats the involvement of a goat or a man wearing a goat's head or with man man's body with a goat head or mm -hmm. the, and the devil in that aspect uh, making an appearance. And all of the imagery, um, Albrecht Durer comes to mind, um, several others, you know, have pictures of, you know, drawing the witch's sabbat with the goat or the man goat or um, this horned god figure involved. And, you know, obviously the witches were persecuted um, to whatever extent, you know, that may be true. To, it was certainly true to some extent. Yeah, but wasn't that a way of them persecuting the old religion because... Well, that's what witchcraft yeah, argues right. is the case. And yeah. that's what I'm... I, it, like, and that's what I think is interesting because that once the horn god becomes suppressed, you, you have witchcraft kind of like rising to public consciousness, really. And, you know, here, here again we have the horn god. So the suppression of the folk religion by the church mm -hmm. becomes Resulted that, yeah. in and more underground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to look at what Eliphas, we've 
Levy or Levi said, because he was really the first person to talk about Baphomet publicly and write mm -hmm. about it and publish the image and that, the we're, image is that, that yes. we're all familiar with from his book. Um, so it's, this is the end of the chapter on the Stone of the Philosophers. Um, after a lot of discussion about um, alchemy and um, Christian theology and Masonic imagery, um, he gets to the point where he's saying, um, does God really exist? Question. There is no knowing, but we desire it to be so, and hence we believe it. Faith thus formulated is reasonable faith, for it admits the doubt of science, and as a fact, we believe only in things which seem to us probable, though we do not know them. Um, he goes through basically talking about um, all natural phenomena depend upon a single and immutable law represented by the philosophical stone and especially by its cubic form. This law, expressed by the Tetrad in the Kabbalah, equipped, by, equipped the Hebrews with all the mysteries of their divine tetragram. It may be said, therefore, that the philosophical stone is the square in every sense, like the heavenly Jerusalem of St. John, that one of its sides is inscribed with the name Shalom, the other with that of God, that one of its facets bears the name of Adam, a second that of Heva, and the two others, those of Azot and Inri. And then he goes on, at the beginning of the French translation of a book on the philosophical salt, the spirit of earth is represented standing on a cube over which tongues of flame are passing. The phallus is replaced by a caduceus the sun and moon figure on the right and left breast. The figure is bearded, crowned, and holds a scepter in his hand. This is the Azoth of the sages on its pedestal of salt and sulfur. The symbolic head of the goat of Mendes is occasionally given to this figure, and it is then the Baphomet of the Templars and the word of the Gnostics. Bizarre images which became scarecrows for the vulgar after affording food for reflection to sages. Innocent hieroglyphs of thought and faith which have been a pretext for the rage of persecutions. How pitiable are men in their ignorance, but how would they despise themselves if they came to know? I mean, I think he said it all when he talked about the Azoth. I mean, there it is, it's, there's the key word. You know, it's a depiction of everything. You know, the Azoth is, you know, chemical terms, I can tell you, I don't even know. It's, it's the first, it's last, it's everything. It's, it's, so there it is, there's everything. For me, that's what Baphomet has always been. I thought it was, in some ways, a, 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 the tree of life in its totality, um, as an image, or again, the idea of... So he's sitting on his cube. Well, he's sitting on his cube, right, well, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I mean, any, any mason will tell you how important that cube sure. is. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and the um, you know, if those familiar with the tarot certainly would see the devil card. It's you right. know, is a is a depiction of Baphomet, mm -hmm. um, and you know, sitting on a cube. He's got the the well, it's got the legs of a goat in, in most representations. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, interestingly, uh, Crowley in the Book of Lies uh, connected Baphomet with the double-headed eagle. So, again, you have that unification of opposites mm -hmm. type of idea. It makes absolute sense. I love looking at Baphomet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people walk in, I tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. People walked in, and a lady walked in, and she saw the Baphomet poster that we have, and mm -hmm. the devil, what do you know? The, and his first reaction was, was, was that kind of... Yeah, that image is powerful. It, it's powerful. It is, I mean, it, it is terrifying, but it should be terrifying. Well, that's... It should be terrifying. The well, world is terrible. Well, let me ask you, in, in a... It, it's meant to be that kind of, that primal, oh, that, but has it, it, was it meant to be that, or has it become that? I well, mean, I don't know. I think, um, I, I, think, think I think the Elvis Levi one was meant to be that. Sure, I yeah. Think, I think he was... Coming out of the age that he was living in, he was trying to be purposefully, mm -hmm. you know, confrontational, but right. 
you know, the the communities that originally worshipped the horn god. Oh, no, no, yeah. that was, well... It could or it could have been bad, I mean... Yeah, but that, that was... Wait, what, what, is, what is your question? So is it, was the horn god originally intended to be terrifying, thought-provoking, shocking? Well, let me just say this. Look at some of their other gods. Tyrannus, the thunderer, the enigmatic sky god, and he was assuaged by putting people in wooden cages and setting them on fire. Uh, Tutates, the god of the tribe, was assuaged by boiling people alive in cauldrons, hmm. and Isis by uh, stringing people up in trees and slashing them. And you know, I don't know if they let the carrion birds take care of them after that, or they would put them out of their misery. But so um, safe bet that the you know you probably should have been terrified by. Your I, I think I think the imagery is not meant as uh, just. To me, personally, my interpretation is imagery from ancient times is not meant as just like the virility of and the, the nature. It, it's like, it is a, like a fearsome representation. And it, even in the Irish myth, the Connell Kernach is this feared warrior who is always like protecting his tribe, but he's one of the most fearsome warriors around and he's not afraid to take on anybody. Throughout history, you know, even when it's suppressed, this idea keeps coming back, and and maybe you know that's part of the reason is because it's is an effective idea, effective way of approaching the the whole big what if you know what what are we doing here? Who is God or what is God? You know, what is nature? You know, where mm -hmm. where do we fit into the scheme of things? Mm -hmm. And I think this image keeps arising throughout history in many different forms. I think it's accreted so much meaning and connection with so many different groups mm -hmm. that it's almost like, well, you see it on sweatshirts and it's all over the internet and everybody knows Baphomet. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, it's... And, but like, it's, always, yeah, it's always, again, it's always at the lowest common denominator usually when it's thought of, I mean... I mean, it's interesting too, in the last quote few me. years, the Book of Baphomet came out, and also the Book of the Horned God, and, you know, surprisingly, like, there hadn't been those books before this. Yeah, but in, yeah, in, in, in pop culture, though, Baphomet is just the devil. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's... You know, if you have got a heavy metal band, you just put Bathman on the cover. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I think that <laughs> you know, that is, in a sense, that is, you could argue, again, like philosophically, that is the, another manifestation of the horned god. Right. Like, you know, and everybody's all. Yeah. So the trickster go. god kind of yeah. thing, you know. Well, and it, yeah, and Anne Ross makes a point in Pagan Celtic Britain. She says, you know, Kernan, uh, the horned god is Mercury. The horned god is Mars. You know, looking at it through different mm. aspects of of mm. other mythologies that we can much more readily understand and identify with. Mm -hmm. And that's that's another problem with uh, with looking back through the lens. Like we can understand Greek myth and Roman mythology so well mm -hmm. because it is very much a Western phenomenon it makes sense to us, I think. Right. Uh, and there's so much of it available to draw. Yeah. And, and we translate other mythologies through that lens. Yeah. And that's, it just complicates it. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's actually helpful in a lot of ways, but it complicates understanding the original ideas. I think it's useful to look at the esoteric meanings for the symbol of the horn god and Baphomet because I think it clues us into aspects of the ancient horn god that might otherwise elude us, like the idea of the serpent being the kundalini energy. I think that's apparent to maybe you or I or Tony, but it, to someone who's not at all familiar with the concept, you know, why would you even associate, you know, you, you don't even know it exists probably. Right. So, um, so I think it's useful. Um, I don't think it's, to me personally, important to connect the ancient horn god with Baphomet and they're the same thing or that there's a secret tradition that's kind of 
perpetuated this idea um, because I feel like this idea has come up in so many different cultures and so many different aspects over time. Um, it's like you said, almost like an egregore of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to me, there's a plenty of questions and not a lot of answers, but the importance of the symbol is paramount in this case. Yeah. I'm curious what you think. Is Baphomet the same as the horn god, the ancient horn god? Does it matter or not? Let us know. <laughs>